the Mandarin's Pearl. Mr. Broadrib stretched out his toes on the curb before the blazing fire with the air of a man who is by no means insensible to physical comfort. You are really an extraordinarily polite fellow, Thorndyke, said he. He was an elderly man, rosy gilled, portly and convivial, to whom a mass of bushy white hair, an expansive double chin and a certain prim sumptuousness of dress imparted an air of old world distinction. Indeed, as he dipped an amethystine nose into his wine glass and gazed thoughtfully at the glowing end of his cigar, he looked the very type of the well-to-do lawyer of an older generation. "'You are really an extraordinarily polite fellow, Thorndyke,' said Mr. Broadrib. "'I know,' replied Thorndyke, "'but why this reference to an admitted fact?' "'The truth has just dawned on me,' said the solicitor, here am I, dropping in on you, uninvited and unannounced, sitting in your own armchair before your fire, smoking your cigars, drinking your burgundy, and deuced good burgundy too, let me add, and you have not dropped a single hint of curiosity as to what has brought me here. I take the gifts of the gods, you see, and ask no questions, said Thorndyke. "'Devilish handsome of you, Thorndyke. Unsociable beggar like you, too,' rejoined Mr. Broadrib, a fan of wrinkles spreading out genially from the corners of his eyes. "'But the fact is I have come, in a sense, on business, always glad of a pretext to look you up, as you know. But I want to take your opinion on a rather queer case. It is about young Calverley. You remember Horace Calverley? Well, this is his son.' Horace and I were schoolmates, you know, and after his death, the boy, Fred, hung on to me rather. We're near neighbours down at Weybridge and very good friends. I like Fred. He's a good fellow, though cranky, like all his people. What has happened to Fred Calverley? Thorndyke asked, as the solicitor paused. Why, the fact is, said Mr. Broderib, just lately he seems to be going a bit queer. Not mad, mind you. At least I think not, but undoubtedly queer. Now there is a good deal of property and a good many highly interested relatives, and as a natural consequence there is some talk of getting him certified. They're afraid he may do something involving the estate or develop homicidal tendencies, and they talk of possible suicide. You remember his father's death? but I say that's all bunkum. The fellow is just a bit cranky and nothing more. What are his symptoms? asked Thorndyke. Oh, he thinks he is being followed about and watched, and he has delusions, sees himself in the glass with the wrong face and that sort of thing, you know. You are not highly circumstantial, Thorndyke remarked. Mr. Broderib looked at me with a genial smile. What a glutton for facts this fellow is, Jervis. But you're right, Thorndyke. I'm vague. However, Fred will be here presently. We travel down together and I took the liberty of asking him to call for me. We'll get him to tell you about his delusions, if you don't mind. He's not shy about them. And meanwhile, I'll give you a few preliminary facts. The trouble began about a year ago. He was in a railway accident, and that knocked him all to pieces. Then he went for a voyage to recruit, and the ship broke her propeller shaft in a storm and became helpless. That didn't improve the state of his nerves. Then he went down the Mediterranean, and after a month or two, back he came, no better than when he started. But here he is, I expect. He went over to the door and admitted a tall, frail young man, whom Thorndyke welcomed with quiet geniality, and settled in a chair by the fire. I looked curiously at our visitor. He was a typical neurotic, slender, fragile, eager, wide-open blue eyes with broad pupils, in which I could plainly see the characteristic hippus, that incessant change of size that marks the unstable, nervous equilibrium. Parted lips and wandering taper fingers were as the stigmata of his disorder. He was of the stuff out of which prophets and devotees, martyrs, reformers and third-rate poets are made. I have been telling Dr. Thorndyke about these nervous troubles of yours, said Mr. Broderick presently. I hope you don't mind. He is an old friend, you know, and he is very much interested.' 
It is very good of him, said Calverley. Then he flushed deeply and added, But they are not really nervous, you know. They can't be merely subjective. You think they can't be, said Thorndyke. No, I am sure they are not. He flushed again like a girl and looked earnestly at Thorndyke with his big, dreamy eyes. But you doctors, he said, are so dreadfully sceptical of all spiritual phenomena. You are such materialists. Yes, said Mr. Broadrib, the doctors are not hot on the supernatural, and that's a fact. Supposing you tell us about your experiences, said Thorndyke persuasively, give us a chance to believe if we can't explain away. Calverley reflected for a few moments, then, looking earnestly at Thorndyke, he said, Very well, if it won't awe you, I will. It is a curious story. I have told Dr. Thorndyke about your voyage and your trip down the Mediterranean, said Mr. Broadrip. Then, said Calverley, I will begin with the events that are actually connected with these strange visitations. The first of these occurred in Marseille. I was in a curio shop there, looking over some Algerian and Moorish tilings, when my attention was attracted by a sort of charm or pendant that hung in a glass case. It was not particularly beautiful, but its appearance was quaint and curious, and took my fancy. It consisted of an oblong block of ebony, in which was set a single pear-shaped pearl more than three-quarters of an inch long. The sides of the ebony block were lacquered, probably to conceal a joint, and bore a number of Chinese characters, and at the top was a little gold image with a hole through it, presumably for a string to suspend it by. Excepting for the pearl, the whole thing was uncommonly like one of those ornamental tablets of Chinese ink. Now, I had taken a fancy to the thing, and I can afford to indulge my fancies in moderation. The man wanted five pounds for it. He assured me that the pearl was a genuine one of fine quality, and obviously did not believe it himself. To me, however, it looked like a real pearl, and I determined to take the risk, so I paid the money, and he bowed me out with a smile. I may almost say a grin of satisfaction. He would not have been so well pleased if he had followed me to a jeweller's, to whom I took it for an expert opinion for the jeweller pronounced the pearl to be undoubtedly genuine and worth anything up to a thousand pounds. A day or two later, I happened to show my new purchase to some men whom I knew, who had dropped in at Marseille in their yacht. They were highly amused at my having bought the thing, and when I told them what I had paid for it, they positively howled with derision. Why, you silly guffin, said one of them, a man named Halliwell. I could have had it ten days ago for half a sovereign, or probably five shillings. I wish now I had bought it, then I could have sold it to you. It seemed that a sailor had been hawking the pendant round the harbour, and had been on board the yacht with it. Deuced anxious the beggar was to get rid of it too, said Halliwell, grinning at the recollection, swore it was a genuine pearl of priceless value, and was willing to deprive himself of it for the trifling sum of half a jimmy. But we'd heard that sort of thing before. However, the curio man seems to have speculated on the chance of meeting with a greenhorn, and he seems to have pulled it off. Lucky curio man! I listened patiently to their jibes, and when they had talked themselves out, I told them about the jeweller. They were most frightfully sick, and when we had taken a pendant to a dealer in gems, who happened to be staying in the town, and he had offered me five hundred pounds for it, their language wasn't fit for a divinity student's debating club. Naturally, the story got noised abroad, and when I left, it was the talk of the place. The general opinion was that the sailor, who was traced to a tea ship that had put into the harbour, had stolen it from some Chinese passenger, and no less than seventeen different Chinamen came forward to claim it as their stolen property. Soon after this I returned to England, and, as my nerves were still in a very shaky state, I came to live with my cousin Alfred, who has a large house at Weybridge. At this time he had a friend staying with him, a certain Captain Raggerton, and the two men appeared to be on very intimate terms. 
I did not take to Raggerton at all. He was a good-looking man, pleasant in his manners and remarkably plausible. But the fact is, I am speaking in strict confidence, of course, he was a bad egg. He had been in the guards, and I don't quite know why he left, but I do know that he played bridge and baccarat pretty heavily at several clubs, and that he had a reputation for being a rather uncomfortably lucky player. He did a good deal at the race meetings, too, and was in general such an obvious undesirable that I could never understand my cousin's intimacy with him, though I must say that Alfred's habits had changed somewhat for the worse since I had left England. The fame of my purchase seems to have preceded me, for when one day I produced the pendant to show them, I found that they knew all about it. Raggerton had heard the story from a naval man, and I gathered vaguely that he had heard something that I had not, and that he did not care to tell me. For when my cousin and he talked about the pearl, which they did pretty often, certain significant looks passed between them, and certain veiled references were made, which I could not fail to notice. One day I happened to be telling them of a curious incident that occurred on my way home. I had travelled to England on one of Holt's big china boats, not liking the crowd and bustle of the regular passenger lines. Now one afternoon, when we had been at sea a couple of days, I took a book down to my berth, intending to have a quiet read till tea time. Soon, however, I dropped off into a doze, and must have remained asleep for over an hour. I awoke suddenly, and as I opened my eyes, I perceived that the door of the stateroom was half open, and a well-dressed Chinaman in native costume was looking in at me. He closed the door immediately, and I remained for a few moments paralysed by the start that he had given me. Then I leaped from my bunk, opened the door, and looked out. But the alleyway was empty. The Chinaman had vanished, as if by magic. This little occurrence made me quite nervous for a day or two, which was very foolish of me, but my nerves were all on edge, and I'm afraid they are still. Yes, said Thorndyke, there was nothing mysterious about the affair. These boats carry a Chinese crew, and the man you saw was probably a serang, or whatever they call the gang captains on these vessels, or he may have been a native passenger who had strayed into the wrong part of the ship. Exactly agreed our client. But to return to Raggerton, he listened with quite extraordinary interest as I was telling this story, and when I had finished, he looked very queerly at my cousin. A deuced odd thing, this Calverley, said he. Of course, it may only be a coincidence, but it really does look as if there was something after all in that. Shut up, Raggerton, said my cousin. We don't want any of that rot. What is he talking about? I asked. Oh, it's only a rotten silly yarn that he has picked up somewhere. You're not to tell him, Raggerton. I don't see why I am not to be told, I said rather sulkily. I'm not a baby. No, said Alfred, but you're an invalid. You don't want any horrors. In effect, he refused to go into the matter any further, and I was left on tenterhooks of curiosity. However, the very next day I got Raggerton alone in the smoking room and had a little talk with him. He had just dropped a hundred pounds on a double event that hadn't come off, and I expected to find him pliable. Nor was I disappointed, for when we had negotiated a little loan, he was entirely at my service and willing to tell me everything, on my promising not to give him away to Alfred. Now you understand, he said, but this yarn about your pearl is nothing but a damn silly fable that's been going the round in Marseille. I don't know where it came from or what sort of demented rotter invented it. I had it from a Johnny in the Mediterranean squadron, and you can have a copy of his letter if you want it. I said that I did want it. Accordingly, that same evening he handed me a copy of the narrative extracted from his friend's letter, the substance of which was this. About four months ago there was lying in Canton Harbour a large English bark. Her name is not mentioned, but that is not material to the story.' 
She had got her cargo stowed and her crew signed on and was only waiting for certain official formalities to be completed before putting to sea on her homeward voyage. Just ahead of her at the same quay was a Danish ship that had been in a collision outside and was now laid up pending the decision of the Admiralty Court. She had been unloaded and her crew paid off, with the exception of one elderly man who remained on board as shipkeeper. Now a considerable part of the cargo of the English bark was the property of a certain wealthy Mandarin, and this person had been about the vessel a good deal while she was taking in her lading. One day when the Mandarin was on board the bark, it happened that three of the seamen were sitting in the galley smoking and chatting with the cook an elderly Chinaman named Wu Li, and the latter, pointing out the Mandarin to the sailors, expatiated on his enormous wealth, assuring them that he was commonly believed to carry on his person articles of sufficient value to buy up the entire lading of a ship. Now, unfortunately for the Mandarin, it chanced that these three sailors were about the greatest rascals on board, which is saying a good deal when one considers the ordinary moral standards that prevails in the forecastle of a sailing ship. Nor was Wu Li himself an angel. In fact, he was a consummate villain and seems to have been the actual originator of the plot which was presently devised to rob the Mandarin. This plot was as remarkable for its simplicity as for its cold-blooded barbarity. On the evening before the bark sailed, the three seamen, Nielsen, Foucault and Parrot, proceeded to the Danish ship with a supply of whisky, made the keeper royally drunk and locked him up in an empty berth. Meanwhile, Woolley made a secret communication to the Mandarin to the effect that certain stolen property believed to be his had been secreted in the hold of the enemy ship. Thereupon the Mandarin came down hot foot to the quayside and was received on board by the three seamen who had got the covers off the after hatch in readiness. Parrot now ran down the iron ladder to show the way and the Mandarin followed, but when they reached the lower deck and looked down the hatch into the black darkness of the lower hold, he seems to have taken fright and begun to climb up again. Meanwhile, Nielsen had made a running bowline in the end of a loose halyard that was rove through a block aloft and had been used for hoisting out the cargo. As the Mandarin came up, he leaned over the combing of the hatch, dropped the noose over the Chinaman's head, jerked it tight, and then he and Foucault hove on the fall of the rope. The unfortunate Chinaman was dragged from the ladder, and as he swung clear, the two rascals let go the rope, allowing him to drop through the hatches into the lower hold. Then they belayed the rope and went down below. Parrot had already lighted a slush lamp, by the glimmer of which they could see the Mandarin swinging to and fro like a pendulum within a few feet of the ballast, and still quivering and twitching in his death throes. They were now joined by Wu Li, who had watched the proceedings from the quay, and the four villains proceeded, without loss of time, to rifle the body as it hung. To their surprise and disgust, they found nothing of value excepting an ebony pendant set with a single large pearl. But Wu Li, though evidently disappointed at the nature of the booty, assured his comrades that this alone was well worth the hazard, pointing out the great size and exceptional beauty of the pearl. As to this, the seamen know nothing about pearls, but the thing was done and had to be made the best of, so they made the rope fast to the lower deck beams, cut off the remainder and unrove it from the block and went back to their ship. It was twenty-four hours before the shipkeeper was sufficiently sober to break out of the berth in which he had been locked, by which time the bark was well out to sea, and it was another three days before the body of the Mandarin was found. An active search was then made for the murderers, but as they were strangers to the shipkeeper, no clues to their whereabouts could be discovered. Meanwhile, the four murderers were a good deal exercised as to the disposal of the booty 
since it could not be divided it was evident that it must be entrusted to the keeping of one of them the choice in the first place fell upon war lee in whose chest the pendant was deposited as soon as the party came on board it being arranged that the chinaman should produce the jewel for inspection by his confederates whenever called upon for six weeks nothing out of the common occurred but then a very singular event befell the four conspirators were sitting outside the galley one evening when suddenly the cook uttered a cry of amazement and horror the other three turned to see what it was that had so disturbed their comrade and then they too were struck dumb with consternation for standing at the door of the companion hatch the bark was a flush-decked vessel was the mandarin whom they had left for dead he stood quietly regarding them for fully a minute while they stared at him transfixed with terror then he beckoned to them and went below so petrified were they with astonishment and mortal fear that they remained for a long time motionless and dumb. At last, they plucked up courage and began to make furtive inquiries among the crew. But no one, not even the steward, knew anything of any passengers or indeed of any Chinaman on board the ship excepting War Li. At daybreak the next morning, when the cook's mate went to the galley to fill the coppers, he found War Lee hanging from a hook in the ceiling. The cook's body was stiff and cold, and had evidently been hanging several hours. The report of the tragedy quickly spread through the ship, and the three conspirators hurried off to remove the pearl from the dead man's chest, before the officers should come to examine it. The cheap lock was easily picked with a bent wire, and the jewel abstracted, but now the question arose as to who should take charge of it. The eagerness to be the actual custodian of the precious bauble, which had been at first displayed, now gave place to equally strong reluctance. But someone had to take charge of it, and after a long and angry discussion, Nielsen was prevailed upon to stow it in his chest." A fortnight passed. The three conspirators went about their duties soberly, like men burdened with some secret anxiety, and in their leisure moments they would sit and talk with bated breath of the apparition at the companion hatch and the mysterious death of their late comrade. At last the blow fell. It was at the end of the second dog watch that the hands were gathered on the forecastle, preparing to make sail for a spell of bad weather. Suddenly, Nielsen gave a husky shout and rushed at Parrot, holding out the key of his chest. "'Here you, Parrot!' he exclaimed. "'Go below and take that accursed thing out of my chest!' "'What for?' demanded Parrot, and then he and Foucault, who were standing close by, looked aft, to see what Nielsen was staring at. Instantly they both turned white as ghosts and fell trembling so that they could hardly stand, for there was the Mandarin, standing calmly by the companion, returning with a steady, impassive gaze their looks of horror. And even as they looked, he beckoned and went below. Do you hear, parrot? gasped Nielsen. Take my key and do what I say or else. But at this moment, the order was given to go aloft and set all plain sail. The three men went off to their respective posts, Nielsen going up the fore topmast rigging and the other two to the main top. Having finished their work aloft, Foucault and Parrot, who were both in the port watch, came down on deck, and then, it being their watch below, they went and turned in. When they turned out with their watch at midnight, they looked about for Nielsen, who was in the starboard watch, but he was nowhere to be seen. Thinking he might have slipped below unobserved, they made no remark, though they were very uneasy about him. But when the starboard watch came on deck at four o'clock, and Nielsen did not appear with his mates, the two men became alarmed and made inquiries about him. It was now discovered that no one had seen him since eight o'clock on the previous evening, and, this being reported to the officer of the watch, the latter ordered all hands to be called. 
but still Nielsen did not appear. A thorough search was now instituted, both below and aloft, and as there was still no sign of the missing man, it was concluded that he had fallen overboard. But at eight o'clock, two men were sent aloft to shake out the four royal. They reached the yard almost simultaneously and were just stepping onto the foot ropes when one of them gave a shout. Then the pair came sliding down a backstay with faces as white as tallow. As soon as they had reached the deck, they took the officer of the watch forward and, standing on the heel of the bowsprit, pointed aloft. Several of the hands, including Foucault and Parrot, had followed, and all looked up, and there they saw the body of Nielsen hanging on the front of the fore-top gallant sail. He was dangling at the end of a gasket and bouncing up and down on the taut belly of the sail as the ship rose and fell to the send of the sea. The two survivors were now in some doubt about having anything further to do with the pearl, but the great value of the jewel and the consideration that it was now to be divided between two instead of four tempted them. They abstracted it from Nielsen's chest, and then, as they could not come to an agreement in any other way, they decided to settle who should take charge of it by tossing a coin. The coin was accordingly spun, and the pearl went to Foucault's chest. From this moment, Foucault lived in a state of continual apprehension. When on deck, his eyes were forever wandering towards the companion hatch, and during his watch below, when not asleep, he would sit moodily on his chest, lost in gloomy reflection. But a fortnight passed, then three weeks, and still nothing happened. Land was sighted, the Straits of Gibraltar passed, and the end of the voyage was but a matter of days, and still the dreaded Mandarin made no sign. At length the ship was within twenty-four hours of Marseille, to which port a large part of the cargo was consigned. Active preparations were being made for entering the port, and among other things, the shore tackle was being overhauled. A share in this latter work fell to Foucault and Parat, and about the middle of the second dog watch, seven o'clock in the evening, they were sitting on the deck working an eye splice in the end of a large rope. Suddenly, Foucault, who was facing forward, saw his companion turn pale and stare aft with an expression of terror. He immediately turned and looked over his shoulder to see what Parat was staring at. It was the Mandarin, standing by the companion, gravely watching them, and as Foucault turned and met his gaze, the Chinaman beckoned and went below. For the rest of that day, Parat kept close to his terrified comrade, and during their watch below, he endeavoured to remain awake, that he might keep his friend in view. Nothing happened through the night, and the following morning, when they came on deck for the forenoon watch, their port was well in sight. The two men now separated for the first time, Parat going aft to take his trick at the wheel, and Foucault being set to help in getting ready the ground tackle. Half an hour later, Parat saw the mate stand on the rail and lean outboard, holding on to the mizzen shrouds while he stared along the ship's side. Then he jumped onto the deck and shouted angrily, Forward there! What the deuce is that man up to under the starboard cathead? The men on the forecastle rushed to the side and looked over. Two of them leaned over the rail with the bite of a rope between them, and a third came running aft to the mate. It's Foucault, sir, Parrot heard him say. He's hanged himself from the cat head. As soon as he was off duty, Parrot made his way to his dead comrade's chest and opening it with his picklock, took out the pearl. It was now his sole property and, as the ship was within an hour or two of her destination, he thought he had little to fear from its murdered owner. As soon as the vessel was alongside the wharf, he would slip ashore and get rid of the jewel, even if he sold it at a comparatively low price. The thing looked perfectly simple. In actual practice, however, it turned out quite otherwise. He began by accosting a well-dressed stranger and offering the pendant for fifty pounds, but the only reply that he got was a knowing smile and a shake of the head. When this experience had been repeated a dozen times or more, and he had been followed up and down the street for nearly an hour by a suspicious gendarme, he began to grow anxious. 
he visited quite a number of ships and yachts in the harbour, and at each refusal the price of his treasure came down, until he was eager to sell it for a few francs. But still no one would have it. Everyone took it for granted that the pearl was a sham, and most of the persons whom he accosted assumed that it had been stolen. The position was getting desperate. Evening was approaching, the time of the dreaded dog watches, and still the pearl was in his possession. Gladly would he now have given it away for nothing, but he dared not try, for this would lay him open to the strongest suspicion. At last, in a by-street, he came upon the shop of a curio dealer. Putting on a careless and cheerful manner, he entered and offered the pendant for ten francs. The dealer looked at it, shook his head, and handed it back. "'What will you give me for it?' demanded Parrot, breaking out into a cold sweat at the prospect of a final refusal. The dealer felt in his pocket, drew out a couple of francs, and held them out. "'Very well,' said Parrot. He took the money as calmly as he could and marched out of the shop, with a gasp of relief leaving the pendant in the dealer's hand. The jewel was hung up in a glass case and nothing more was thought about it, until some ten days later, when an English tourist who came into the shop noticed it and took a liking to it. Thereupon the dealer offered it to him for five pounds, assuring him that it was a genuine pearl, a statement that, to his amazement, the stranger evidently believed. He was then deeply afflicted at not having asked a higher price, but the bargain had been struck, and the Englishman went off with his purchase. This was the story told by Captain Raggerton's friend, and I have given it to you in full detail, having read the manuscript over many times since it was given to me. No doubt you will regard it as a mere traveller's tale, and consider me a superstitious idiot for giving any credence to it. It certainly seems more remarkable for picturesqueness than for credibility, Thorndyke agreed. May I ask, he continued, whether Captain Raggerton's friend gave any explanation as to how this singular story came to his knowledge or to that of anybody else? Oh, yes, replied Calverley. I forgot to mention that the seaman parrot, very shortly after he had sold the pearl, fell down the hatch into the hold as the ship was unloading and was very badly injured. He was taken to the hospital where he died on the following day, and it was while he was lying there in a dying condition that he confessed to the murder and gave this circumstantial account of it. I see, said Thorndyke, and I understand that you accept the story as literally true? Undoubtedly, Calverley flushed defiantly as he returned Thorndyke's look and continued, You see, I am not a man of science, Therefore, my beliefs are not limited to things that can be weighed and measured. There are things, Dr. Thorndyke, which are outside the range of our puny intellects, things that science, with its arrogant materialism, puts aside and ignores with close-shut eyes. I prefer to believe in things which obviously exist, even though I cannot explain them. It is the humbler, and I think, the wiser attitude. But my dear Fred, protested Mr. Broadrib, this is a rank fairy tale. Calverley turned upon the solicitor. If you had seen what I have seen, you would not only believe, you would know. Tell us what you have seen then, said Mr. Broadrib. I will if you wish to hear it, said Calverley. I will continue the strange history of the Mandarin's pearl. He lit a fresh cigarette and continued. The night I came to Beechhurst, that is my cousin's house, you know, a rather absurd thing happened, which I mention on account of its connection with what has followed. I had gone to my room early and sat for some time writing letters before getting ready for bed. When I had finished my letters, I started on a tour of inspection of my room. I was then, you must remember, in a very nervous state, and it had become my habit to examine the room in which I was to sleep before undressing, looking under the bed and in any cupboards and closets that there happened to be. Now, on looking round my new room, I perceived that there was a second door, and I at once proceeded to open it to see where it led to. 
As soon as I opened the door, I got a terrible start. I found myself looking into a narrow closet or passage, lined with pegs, on which the servant had hung some of my clothes. At the farther end was another door, and as I stood looking into the closet, I observed, with startled amazement, a man standing, holding the door half open, and silently regarding me. I stood for a moment staring at him, with my heart thumping and my limbs all of a tremble. Then I slammed the door and ran off to look for my cousin. He was in the billiard room with Raggerton, and the pair looked up sharply as I entered. Alfred, I said, where does that passage lead to out of my room? Lead to, said he. Why, it doesn't lead anywhere. It used to open into a cross corridor, but when the house was altered, the corridor was done away with, and this passage closed up. It is only a cupboard now. Well, there was a man in it, or there was, just now. Nonsense, he exclaimed. Impossible. Let us go and look at the place. He and Raggerton rose, and we went together to my room. As we flung open the door of the closet and looked in, we all three burst into a laugh. There were three men now looking at us from the open door at the other end, and the mystery was solved. A large mirror had been placed at the end of the closet to cover the partition which cut it off from the cross corridor. This incident naturally exposed me to a good deal of chaff from my cousin and Captain Raggerton, but I often wished that the mirror had not been placed there, for it happened over and over again that going to the cupboard hurriedly and not thinking of the mirror, I got quite a bad shock on being confronted by a figure apparently coming straight at me through an open door. In fact, it annoyed me so much in my nervous state that I even thought of asking my cousin to give me a different room. But, happening to refer to the matter when talking to Raggerton, I found the captain so scornful of my cowardice that my pride was touched and I let the affair drop. And now I come to a very strange occurrence, which I shall relate quite frankly, although I know beforehand that you will set me down as a liar or a lunatic. I had been away from home for a fortnight, and as I returned rather late at night, I went straight to my room. Having partly undressed, I took my clothes in one hand and a candle in the other and opened the cupboard door. I stood for a moment looking nervously at my double, standing, candle in hand, looking at me through the open door at the other end of the passage. Then I entered, and setting the candle on a shelf, proceeded to hang up my clothes. I had hung them up and had just reached up for the candle when my eye was caught by something strange in the mirror. It no longer reflected the candle in my hand, but instead of it, a large coloured paper lantern. I stood petrified with astonishment and gazed into the mirror, and then I saw that my own reflection was changed too, that in place of my own figure was that of an elderly Chinaman, who stood regarding me with stony calm. I must have stood for near upon a minute, unable to move and scarce able to breathe, face to face with that awful figure. At length I turned to escape, and as I turned, he turned also, and I could see him over my shoulder, hurrying away. As I reached the door, I halted for a moment, looking back with the door in my hand, holding the candle above my head, and even so, he halted, looking back at me, with his hand upon the door, and his lantern held above his head. I was so much upset that I could not go to bed for some hours, but continued to pace the room, in spite of my fatigue. Now and again I was impelled, irresistibly, to peer into the cupboard, but nothing was to be seen in the mirror save my own figure, candle in hand, peeping in at me through the half-open door and each time that I looked into my own white horror-stricken face, I shut the door hastily and turned away with a shudder, for the pegs with the clothes hanging on them seemed to call to me. I went to bed at last, and before I fell asleep, I formed the resolution that, if I was spared until the next day, I would write to the British consul at Canton and offer to restore the pearl to the relatives of the murdered Mandarin. On the following day I wrote and dispatched the letter, after which I felt more composed, though I was haunted continually by the recollection of that stony, impassive figure. 
and from time to time I felt an irresistible impulse to go and look in at the door of the closet, at the mirror, and the pegs with the clothes hanging from them. I told my cousin of the visitation that I had received, but he merely laughed, and was frankly incredulous, while the captain bluntly advised me not to be a superstitious donkey. For some days after this I was left in peace, and began to hope that my letter had appeased the spirit of the murdered man, but on the fifth day, about six o'clock in the evening, happening to want some papers that I had left in the pocket of a coat which was hanging in the closet, I went in to get them. I took in no candle, as it was not yet dark, but left the door wide open to light me. The coat that I wanted was near the end of the closet, not more than four paces from the mirror, and as I went towards it, I watched my reflection rather nervously as it advanced to meet me. I found my coat, and as I felt for the papers, I still kept a suspicious eye on my double, and even as I looked, a most strange phenomenon appeared. The mirror seemed for an instant to darken or cloud over, and then, as it cleared again, I saw, standing dark against the light of the open door behind him, the figure of the Mandarin. After a single glance, I ran out of the closet, shaking with agitation, but as I turned to shut the door, I noticed that it was my own figure that was reflected in the glass. The Chinaman had vanished in an instant. It now became evident that my letter had not served its purpose, and I was plunged in despair, the more so since, on this day, I felt again the dreadful impulse to go and look at the pegs on the wall of the closet. There was no mistaking the meaning of that impulse, and each time that I went, I dragged myself away reluctantly, though shivering with horror. One circumstance indeed encouraged me a little. The Mandarin had not, on either occasion, beckoned to me as he had done to the sailors, so that perhaps some way of escape yet lay open to me. During the next few days I considered very earnestly what measures I could take to avert the doom that seemed to be hanging over me. The simplest plan, that of passing the pearl on to some other person, was out of the question. It would be nothing short of murder. On the other hand, I could not wait for an answer to my letter, for even if I remained alive, I felt that my reason would have given way long before the reply reached me. But while I was debating what I should do, the Mandarin appeared to me again, and then, after an interval of only two days, he came to me once more. That was last night. I remained gazing at him, fascinated, with my flesh creeping as he stood, lantern in hand, looking steadily in my face. At last he held out his hand to me, as if asking me to give him the pearl. Then the mirror darkened, and he vanished in a flash, and in the place where he had stood there was my own reflection, looking at me out of the glass. That last visitation decided me. When I left home this morning, the pearl was in my pocket, and as I came over Waterloo Bridge, I leaned over the parapet and flung the thing into the water. After that, I felt quite relieved for a time. I had shaken the accursed thing off without involving anyone in the curse that it carried. But presently, I began to feel fresh misgivings, and the conviction has been growing upon me all day that I have done the wrong thing. I have only placed it for ever beyond the reach of its owner, whereas I ought to have burnt it after the Chinese fashion, so that its non-material essence could have joined the spiritual body of him to whom it had belonged when both were clothed with material substance. But it can't be altered now, for good or for evil, the thing is done, and God alone knows what the end of it will be. As he concluded, Calverley uttered a deep sigh and covered his face with his slender, delicate hands. For a space we were all silent and, I think, deeply moved. For grotesquely unreal as the whole thing was, there was a pathos and even a tragedy in it that we all felt to be very real indeed. Suddenly Mr. Broadrib started and looked at his watch. "'Good gracious, Calverley, we shall lose our train!' The young man pulled himself together and stood up. 
We shall just do it if we go at once, said he. Goodbye, he added, shaking Thorndyke's hand and mine. You have been very patient, and I have been rather prosy, I am afraid. Come along, Mr. Brodrib. Thorndyke and I followed them out to the landing, and I heard my colleague say to the solicitor in a low tone, but very earnestly, Get him away from that house, Brodrib, and don't let him out of your sight for a moment. I did not catch the solicitor's reply, if he made any, but when we were back in our room, I noticed that Thorndyke was more agitated than I had ever seen him. I ought not to have let them go, he exclaimed. Confound me! If I had had a grain of wit, I should have made them lose their train. He lit his pipe and fell to pacing the room with long strides, his eyes bent on the floor with an expression sternly reflective. At last, finding him hopelessly taciturn, I knocked up my pipe and went to bed. As I was dressing on the following morning, Thorndyke entered my room. His face was grave, even to sternness, and he held a telegram in his hand. I'm going to Weybridge this morning, he said shortly, holding the flimsy out to me. Shall you come? I took the paper from him and read. Come, for God's sake. F.C. is dead. You will understand. Broadrib. I handed him back the telegram, too much shocked for a moment to speak. The whole dreadful tragedy summed up in that curt message rose before me in an instant, and a wave of deep pity swept over me at this miserable end to the sad, empty life. "'What an awful thing, Thorndyke!' I exclaimed at length, to be killed by a mere grotesque delusion. "'Do you think so?' he asked dryly. "'Well, we shall see, but you will come.' Yes, I replied, and as he retired, I proceeded hurriedly to finish dressing. Half an hour later, as we rose from a rapid breakfast, Paulton came into the room, carrying a small roll-up case of tools and a bunch of skeleton keys. Will you have them in the bag, sir? he asked. No, replied Thorndyke, in my overcoat pocket. Oh, and here is a note, Poulton, which I want you to take round to Scotland Yard. It is to the Assistant Commissioner, and you are to make sure that it is in the right hands before you leave. And here is a telegram to Mr. Brodrib. He dropped the keys and the tool case into his pocket, and we went down together to the waiting hansom. At Weybridge Station, we found Mr. Brodrib pacing the platform in a state of extreme dejection. He brightened up somewhat when he saw us and wrung our hands with emotional heartiness. It was very good of you both to come at a moment's notice, he said warmly, and I feel your kindness very much. You understood, of course, Thorndyke. Yes, Thorndyke replied. I suppose the Mandarin beckoned to him. Mr. Brodrib turned with a look of surprise. How did you guess that? he asked, and then, without waiting for a reply, he took from his pocket a note, which he handed to my colleague. The poor old fellow left this for me, he said. The servant found it on his dressing table. Thorndyke glanced through the note and passed it to me. It consisted of but a few words, hurriedly written in a tremulous hand. He has beckoned to me, and I must go. Goodbye, dear old friend. How does his cousin take the matter? asked Thorndyke. He doesn't know of it yet, replied the lawyer. Alfred and Raggerton went out after an early breakfast to cycle over to Guildford on some business or other, and they have not returned yet. The catastrophe was discovered soon after they left. The maid went to his room with a cup of tea and was astonished to find that his bed had not been slept in. She ran down in alarm and reported to the butler, who went up at once and searched the room, but he could find no trace of the missing one, except my note, until it occurred to him to look in the cupboard. As he opened the door, he got rather a start from his own reflection in the mirror, and then he saw poor Fred hanging from one of the pegs near the end of the closet, close to the glass. It's a melancholy affair. But here is the house and here is the butler waiting for us. Mr. Alfred is not back yet then, Stevens? No, sir. The white-faced, frightened-looking man had evidently been waiting at the gate from distaste of the house, and he now walked back with manifest relief at our arrival. 
When we entered the house, he ushered us without remark up on to the first floor, and preceding us along a corridor, halted near the end. "'That's the room, sir,' said he, and without another word he turned and went down the stairs. We entered the room and Mr. Broadrib followed on tiptoe, looking about him fearfully and casting awestruck glances at the shrouded form on the bed. To the latter, Thorndyke advanced and gently drew back the sheet. "'You'd better not look, Broadrib,' said he, as he bent over the corpse. He felt the limbs and examined the cord, which still remained round the neck, its raggedly severed end testifying to the terror of the servants who had cut down the body. Then he replaced the sheet and looked at his watch. It happened about three o'clock in the morning, said he. He must have struggled with the impulse for some time, poor fellow. Now let us look at the cupboard. We went together to a door in the corner of the room, and as we opened it, we were confronted by three figures, apparently looking in at us through an open door at the other end. It is really rather startling, said the lawyer in a subdued voice, looking almost apprehensively at the three figures that advanced to meet us. The poor lad ought never to have been here. It was certainly an eerie place, and I could not but feel, as we walked down the dark, narrow passage, with those other three dimly seen figures silently coming towards us and mimicking our every gesture, that it was no place for a nervous, superstitious man like poor Fred Calverley. Close to the end of the long row of pegs was one from which hung an end of stout box cord, and to this Mr. Broderick pointed with an awestruck gesture but Thorndyke gave it only a brief glance and then walked up to the mirror, which he proceeded to examine minutely. It was a very large glass, nearly seven feet high, extending the full width of the closet and reaching to within a foot of the floor, and it seemed to have been let into the partition from behind, for both above and below the woodwork was in front of it. While I was making these observations, I watched Thorndyke with no little curiosity. First, he wrapped his knuckles on the glass. Then he lighted a wax match and, holding it close to the mirror, carefully watched the reflection of the flame. Finally, laying his cheek on the glass, he held the match at arm's length, still close to the mirror, and looked at the reflection along the surface. Then he blew out the match and walked back into the room, shutting the cupboard door as we emerged. I think, said he, that as we shall all undoubtedly be subpoenaed by the coroner, it would be well to put together a few notes of the facts. I see there is a writing table by the window, and I would propose that you, Brodrib, just jot down a pressy of the statement that you heard last night, while Jervis notes down the exact condition of the body. While you are doing this, I will take a look round. We might find a more cheerful place to write in, grumbled Mr. Broadrib. However, without finishing the sentence, he sat down at the table and, having found some sermon paper, dipped a pen in the ink by way of encouraging his thoughts. At this moment, Thorndyke quietly slipped out of the room and I proceeded to make a detailed examination of the body, in which occupation I was interrupted at intervals by requests from the lawyer that I should refresh his memory. We had been occupied thus for about a quarter of an hour, when a quick step was heard outside. The door was opened abruptly, and a man burst into the room. Broderib rose and held out his hand. "'This is a sad homecoming for you, Alfred,' said he. "'Yes, my God,' the newcomer exclaimed. "'It's awful!' He looked askance at the corpse on the bed and wiped his forehead with his handkerchief. Alfred Calverley was not extremely prepossessing. Like his cousin, he was obviously neurotic, but there were signs of dissipation in his face, which, just now, was pale and ghastly and wore an expression of abject fear. Moreover, his entrance was accompanied by that of a perceptible odour of brandy. He had walked over without noticing me to the writing table, and as he stood there, talking in subdued tones with the lawyer, I suddenly found Thorndyke at my side. 
he had stolen in noiselessly through the door that Calverley had left open. Show him Brodrib's note, he whispered, and then make him go in and look at the peg. With this mysterious request, he slipped out of the room as silently as he had come, unperceived either by Calverley or the lawyer. Has Captain Raggerton returned with you? Brodrib was inquiring. No, he has gone into the town, was the reply, but he won't be long. This will be a frightful shock to him. At this point, I stepped forward. Have you shown Mr. Calverley the extraordinary letter that the deceased left for you? I asked. What letter was that? demanded Calverley with a start. Mr. Brodrib drew forth the note and handed it to him. As he read it through, Calverley turned white to the lips, and the paper trembled in his hand. He has beckoned to me, and I must go, he read, then with a furtive glance at the lawyer. Who had beckoned? What did he mean? Mr. Brodrib briefly explained the meaning of the allusion, adding, I thought you knew all about it. Yes, yes, said Calverley with some confusion. I remember the matter now you mention it, but it's also dreadful and bewildering. At this point, I again interposed. There is a question, I said, that may be of some importance. It refers to the cord with which the poor fellow hanged himself. Can you identify that cord, Mr. Calverley? I he exclaimed, staring at me and wiping the sweat from his white face. How should I? Where is the cord? Part of it is still hanging from the peg in the closet. Would you mind looking at it? If you would very kindly fetch it, you know I uh, naturally have a... It must not be disturbed before the inquest, said I, but surely you are not afraid. I didn't say I was afraid, he retorted angrily, why should I be? With a strange, tremulous swagger, he strode across to the closet, flung open the door and plunged in. A moment later, we heard a shout of horror and he rushed out, livid and gasping. What is it, Calverley? exclaimed Mr. Brodrib, starting up in alarm. But Calverley was incapable of speech. Dropping limply into a chair, he gazed at us for a while in silent terror. Then he fell back, uttering a wild shriek of laughter. Mr. Brodrib looked at him in amazement. What is it, Calverley? he asked again. As no answer was forthcoming, he stepped across to the open door of the closet and entered, peering curiously before him. Then he too uttered a startled exclamation and backed out hurriedly, looking pale and flurried. Bless my soul, he ejaculated. Is the place bewitched? He sat down heavily and stared at Calverley, who was still shaking with hysteric laughter, while I, now consumed with curiosity, walked over to the closet to discover the cause of their singular behaviour. As I flung open the door, which the lawyer had closed, I must confess to being very considerably startled, for though the reflection of the open door was plain enough in the mirror, my own reflection was replaced by that of a Chinaman. After a momentary pause of astonishment, I entered the closet and walked towards the mirror, and simultaneously the figure of the Chinaman entered and walked towards me. I had advanced more than halfway down the closet when suddenly the mirror darkened. There was a whirling flash. The Chinaman vanished in an instant, and as I reached the glass, my own reflection faced me. I turned back into the room, pretty completely enlightened, and looked at Calverley with a new-born distaste. He still sat facing the bewildered lawyer, one moment sobbing convulsively, the next yelping with hysteric laughter. He was not an agreeable spectacle, and when a few moments later Thorndyke entered the room and halted by the door with a stare of disgust, I was moved to join him. But at this juncture, a man pushed past Thorndyke and striding up to Calverley shook him roughly by the arm. Stop that row, he exclaimed furiously. Do you hear? Stop it. I can't help it, Raggerton, gasped Calverley. He gave me such a turn, the mandarin, you know. What? ejaculated Raggerton. 
He dashed across to the closet, looked in and turned upon Calverley with a snarl. Then he walked out of the room. Brodrib, said Thorndyke, I should like to have a word with you and Jervis outside. Then, as we followed him out onto the landing, he continued, I have something rather interesting to show you. It is in here. He softly opened an adjoining door, and we looked into a small, unfurnished room. A projecting closet occupied one side of it, and at the door of the closet stood Captain Raggerton with his hand upon the key. He turned upon us fiercely, though with a look of alarm, and demanded, What is the meaning of this intrusion, and who the deuce are you? Do you know that this is my private room? I suspected that it was, Thorndyke replied quietly. Those will be your properties in the closet, then. Raggerton turned pale, but continued to bluster. Do I understand that you have dared to break into my private closet? He demanded. I have inspected it, replied Thorndyke, and I may remark that it is useless to wrench at that key, because I have hampered the lock. The devil you have, shouted Raggerton. Yes, you see, I am expecting a police officer with a search warrant, so I wish to keep everything intact. Raggerton turned livid with mingled fear and rage. He stalked up to Thorndyke with a threatening air, but suddenly, altering his mind, exclaimed, I must see to this, and flung out of the room. Thorndyke took a key from his pocket, and having locked the door, turned to the closet. Having taken out the key to unhamper the lock with a stout wire, he reinserted it and unlocked the door. As we entered, we found ourselves in a narrow closet, similar to the one in the other room, but darker owing to the absence of a mirror. A few clothes hung from the pegs, and when Thorndyke had lit a candle that stood on a shelf, we could see more of the details. Here are some of the properties, said Thorndyke. He pointed to a peg from which hung a long blue silk gown of Chinese make, a mandarin's cap with a pigtail attached to it, and a beautifully made papier-mâché mask. Observe, said Thorndyke, taking the latter down and exhibiting a label on the inside, marked Renoir de Paris. No trouble has been spared. He took off his coat, slipped on the gown, the mask and the cap, and was in a moment, in that dim light, transformed into the perfect semblance of a Chinaman. By taking a little more time, he remarked, pointing to a pair of Chinese shoes and a large paper lantern, the makeup could be rendered more complete. But this seems to have answered for our friend Alfred. But, said Mr. Brodrib, as Thorndyke shed the disguise, still, I don't understand. I will make it clear to you in a moment, said Thorndyke. He walked to the end of the closet and tapping the right hand wall said, this is the back of the mirror. You see that it is hung on massive, well oiled hinges and is supported on this large rubber tied caster, which evidently has bought bearings. You observe three black cords running along the wall and passing through these pulleys above. Now, when I pull this cord, notice what happens. He pulled one cord firmly, and immediately the mirror swung noiselessly inward on its great caster until it stood diagonally across the closet, where it was stopped by a rubber buffer. Bless my soul, exclaimed Mr. Brodrib. What an extraordinary thing. The effect was certainly very strange, for the mirror being now exactly diagonal to the two closets, they appeared to be a single, continuous passage with a door at either end. On going up to the mirror, we found that the opening which it had occupied was filled by a sheet of plain glass, evidently placed there as a precaution to prevent any person from walking through from one closet into the other and so discovering the trick. It's all very puzzling, said Mr. Brodrib. I don't clearly understand it now. Let us finish here, replied Thorndyke, and then I will explain. Notice this black curtain. When I pull the second cord, it slides across the closet and cuts off the light. The mirror now reflects nothing into the other closet. It simply appears dark. And now I pull the third cord. 
He did so, and the mirror swung noiselessly back into its place. There is only one other thing to observe before we go out, said Thorndyke, and that is this other mirror standing with its face to the wall. This, of course, is the one that Fred Calverley originally saw at the end of the closet. It has since been removed and the larger swinging glass put in its place. And now, he continued, when we came out into the room, let me explain the mechanism in detail. It was obvious to me when I heard poor Fred Calverley's story that the mirror was faked, and I drew a diagram of the probable arrangement, which turns out to be correct. Here it is. He took a sheet of paper from his pocket and handed it to the lawyer. There are two sketches. Sketch one shows the mirror in its ordinary position, closing the end of the closet. A person standing at A, of course, sees his reflection facing him at, apparently, A1. Sketch 2 shows the mirror swung across. Now, a person standing at A does not see his own reflection at all. But if some other person is standing on the other closet at B, A sees the reflection of B, apparently, at B1. That is, in the identical position that his own reflection occupied when the mirror was straight across. I see now, said Broadrib, but who set up this apparatus and why was it done? Let me ask you a question, said Thorndyke. Is Alfred Calverley the next of kin? No, there is Fred's younger brother, but I may say that Fred has made a will quite recently, very much in Alfred's favour. There is the explanation then, said Thorndyke. These two scoundrels have conspired to drive the poor fellow to suicide, and Raggerton was clearly the leading spirit. He was evidently concocting some story with which to work on poor Fred's superstitions when the mention of the Chinaman on the steamer gave him his cue. He then invented the very picturesque story of the murdered Mandarin and the stolen pearl. You remember that these visitations did not begin until after that story had been told and Fred had been absent from the house on a visit. Evidently, during his absence, Raggerton took down the original mirror and substituted this swinging arrangement and at the same time procured the Chinaman's dress and mask from the theatrical property dealers. No doubt he reckoned on being able quietly to remove the swinging glass and other properties and replace the original mirror before the inquest. By God, exclaimed Mr. Broderib, it's the most infamous cowardly plot I have ever heard of. They shall go to jail for it, the villains, as sure as I'm alive. But in this, Mr. Broderib was mistaken. For immediately on finding themselves detected, the two conspirators have left the house and by nightfall were safely across the channel. And the only satisfaction that the lawyer obtained was the setting aside of the will on facts disclosed at the inquest. As to Thorndyke, he has never to this day forgiven himself for having allowed Fred Calverley to go home to his death. End of chapter 6